Well, as, uh, as the ushers continue to receive your offerings, uh, I just want to say hello to those that are joining us uh, from West Lafayette, our West Lafayette campus, or maybe joining us online. I, uh, I know my wife is joining us today online because she, uh, she had surgery on Monday, many of you know, and she's, she is recovering from that. Hopefully she'll be back next Sunday, if not for sure the Sunday after, but uh, there are many people joining us from a lot of different places around America, around our community, around the globe. And so, hello, we're glad that you're joining us today. Today, I'm excited because we're continuing our series called Firestarter. We've been looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And uh, I, have, I have enjoyed this series. We're going to be carrying on with the book of Acts until the end of this month. And uh, as, we, as we've been looking at the book of Acts... We've seen how God used certain people. God used certain personalities to, to channel his plan for the world. and In fact, to, to set fire to people's lives and to change people's lives throughout the world. He used certain personalities. And so in the beginning of the book of Acts, we focus on personalities like Peter. He preached on the day of Pentecost when the people received the Holy Spirit and preached to, to the crowd that was gathered there. 3,000 people, we're told, came to faith in Christ. In the next chapter, in Acts chapter 3, we read about how Peter and John were walking into the temple, and uh, there was a needy, uh, lame beggar who was asking them for money, and they were able to heal him in Jesus' name. The story of Acts goes on. Peter and John, they become the subject of, of persecution and, and all kinds of trouble, and they... They are, are beaten, and God uses them anyway. And then as the, as the story goes on, the apostles, they keep preaching there in the, book, in the city of Jerusalem, and they, they're all arrested. They're told not to, not to keep doing what they're doing, and they say, no, we're, gonna, we're definitely going to keep doing what we've been doing. We continue to teach in the name of Jesus and, and heal people. And so they're beaten. They're released. And then the story moves on, and it moves on to some more personalities. Stephen is a person that the book of Acts focuses on. He's somebody who, he was one of the first deacons at the church in Jerusalem, as it's a servant of the church, and he had this incredible gift for teaching, and, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he ends up getting in trouble, in such trouble that the persecution of the church reaches a climax, and Stephen is stoned to death. They throw stones at him, and they kill him. And they're standing in the crowd, holding the coats of those who are throwing the stones, is a young man named Saul. Saul's another personality that will shape the work of God in the book of Acts. We'll, we'll visit him today. But also, there in the book of Acts, as soon as their stoning happens, we're told that the church scattered from Jerusalem. They, they, they went to other places. One of the people who scattered was a man named Philip. And Philip was preaching in a, in a city of, called Samaria, in a city of Samaria. And he, he had gone to this place, he's preaching, people believe, and then he preaches to another man on a desert road from Ethiopia. And that man believes. And so the gospel is spreading throughout the world. God was using people, as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, to spread his word. That's what happens in the book of Acts. And while this is happening, one personality becomes increasingly agitated about the gospel and about Christians, and that's the person of Saul. We're going to learn about him more today. Saul, he's known as Saul of Tarsus, and we know him more, more often, more familiarly as Paul. But Saul of Tarsus, he, uh, he shows up here Finally, we focus in on him at the beginning of Acts chapter 9. You can look at it in the Bible. You can look at it in your, in your outline. Maybe you're looking at it in the bulletin or somewhere online. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, we're told, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now Saul, he came from a city called Tarsus. Tarsus is in what is today eastern Turkey. But in the ancient Mediterranean world, Tarsus was an important city for learning. In fact, Tarsus had the third largest library in the whole world, was in Tarsus at this time. So that if you were, if you were a great uh, teacher or scholar 
or student, you would have sought to live in Tarsus. And in fact, Saul is, is such, um, he, he's, he's a person of great intellectual power. He, he's somebody who, who uh, learns uh, certainly a lot about Judaism, but he also has learning that has to do with classical learning. We know that from how his preaching appears later in the book of Acts. But Saul becomes, at some point in his life, he, he gets noticed there in Tarsus, it's hundreds of miles from Jerusalem, he gets noticed for being a very bright student of Judaism. And so he becomes the student of the most famous rabbi outside of Jesus in the first century, a man named Gamaliel. Gamaliel is so well known in the ancient world, he's mentioned in fact in, in secular literature in the ancient world because he, he was known for such incredible brilliance and eloquence. And Saul becomes his student. Now in the ancient world, the way that you became, if you were a Jew, the way that you became a student of a famous rabbi like that was not because your family was connected and wealthy, it was because you were the brightest of the bright. In fact, as children prepared to become rabbis in the ancient world, they not only memorized the first five books of the, of the Bible, they memorized the entirety of what is our Old Testament. And those who become, became the most distinguished students, they not only memorized and could quote to you the entire Old Testament, they would memorize all of the commentaries on the Old Testament. And then they could form arguments about the Old Testament from all that they'd memorized. And so you can imagine Saul must have been an incredible person, mind, personality to be around. Brilliant person. But here in his life, at this point in his life, he decides that the cause that he's going to take up, the thing that he's going to marshal all of his energies and giftings and talents for, is to destroy Christianity. So he's breathing out murderous threats against the disciples. I, I get the picture of like a dragon, you know? Every time he breathes, he's, he's breathing out fire. That's kind of the way that Saul is. And he went to the high priest, so he's, he's connected to people who are politically connected. And he asked, he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. Now Damascus is, today, it's about a five and a half hour drive from Jerusalem, but in the days of the, New of, the, of the New Testament, Jerusalem is a six-day walk from Damascus. And so, so here we see that Saul is becoming obsessed with people who live a six-day's journey of walking from him. And, and he, he asks for these letters, and he wants, to say, he wants these letters to say that if he finds any there who belong to the way, that is, they belong to Jesus whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is where the, the religious tribunal is, in, in essence. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, so he's traveled five, five and a half days. He's getting very close to where he's headed. I want you to remember that in his journeying and all these things that he's doing, his conscience doesn't bother him. He's absolutely convinced that he's doing the will of God. He's doing the right thing. So he's never spent a night lying awake thinking about how he was there helping to kill that young man named Stephen. That's nothing he's worried about. He's not worried. He's never having like a, a crisis of the soul, wondering if he's, if he's right or wrong about Jesus. That's not, that's not his experience at all. He's totally convinced that he's doing the right thing and that he's serving God by persecuting the church in the way that he is. And he's walked now five, five and a half days and he's getting close to Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. God came looking for Saul. Even though Saul wasn't interested in what God was really up to in Jesus, in fact, he was opposed to it, God came looking for Saul this light flashes around him and says he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him. I just want you to notice as you look at this passage, I want you to notice Saul never saw Jesus. Saul never 
saw his face. He didn't see his hand. He just sees this blinding, bright light. And he hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why are you after me, Saul? And Saul, he doesn't know exactly what's going on, but he asks this question, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. I want you to notice, there's no invitation for Saul to come to faith. There's no reasoning with Saul about, you know, what's right or, or why Jesus is right or why the followers of Jesus are right. This white light shows up, knocks him to the ground, and tells him what he must do next. Tells him that he, he, this is Jesus. And, and it says that the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. They heard a sound, but they didn't hear the words. They were aware that Saul was going through some kind of personal moment of some problem, but they didn't know what it was. They couldn't, they couldn't corroborate his story in any way. That he saw a light, or he heard a voice, or, or anything like that. They just stood there speechless. They know something strange is going on. And Saul got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Saul was blinded by this bright white light that he saw. He, he, he didn't know what would happen next. And it says they led him to the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. And he did not eat or drink anything. Now what's fascinating to me in this story is that, is that Saul, even though he has this incredible confronting vision with, uh, of, of this bright light of Jesus, even though he, up to that point, had never considered that he was on the wrong path, when he's thrown to the ground, he obviously begins to change his mind. Repentance, a journey of repentance begins for Saul. He can't, he can't imagine that he's been wrong, but clearly he is. Now sometimes, sometimes when people read this passage, they, they want to imagine that something is going on here that's not supernatural. And so many people, they've turned to this passage and they've said, well, what's going on here is that Saul is having some kind of, of heat stroke. It's the middle of the day. It's very warm out there in the desert. And he's just, he's just overcome. But I want you to notice, there, there's, really, there's really nothing that would be similar to this in the history of any religion where someone has a stroke and then that stroke led to changing the world in quite the way that Paul did. Paul, Saul, who would become Paul, he's, he's going to write a third of the New Testament. He's going to, to push the borders of the gospel to, to brand new places that have never heard of Jesus or don't even know anything about the God of Israel. He's going to end up suffering profoundly for his faith in Jesus. In fact, a lot of the rest of the New Testament catalogs the sufferings of Paul. And if it had merely been a stroke that he had, or if he merely had some kind of exquisite, kind of weird experience, well, it led him to such certainty about truth, about his own life, about who God was, that he would die for it. Not just die once, but Paul would end up suffering in, in all kinds of ways. He talks about being hungry and thirsty and naked. He talks about being 
stoned and left for dead. He talks about being beaten with whips within an inch of his life five times. This experience that Paul had on the road to Damascus, it's where everything absolutely changes for him. But I also want you to be aware of this. It's where everything absolutely changes for the rest of us. In the history of the church, there is probably not a greater example of conversion and personal change than there is in Paul. Because not only would he pin a lot of our our New Testament, but his insistence on preaching the gospel to people who are not Jewish would mean that the gospel would expand and expand and expand in ways far beyond what anyone could have ever dreamed. Do you know that today there are more people who call themselves Christians on the earth than lived on the entire planet in the first century? It's because God changed a man named Paul. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul began to change the world. Now when I look at this story, I also am struck by the fact that Saul seems like the most unlikely sort of person who would have turned to Jesus. He has a very bright career in being a Jewish religious person. He, he's got his own trade, his own business. He's, he makes tents. He may employ other people. He's somebody who is so certain of his ideas about God that he is going after imprisoning all the Christians. And yet, he changes course here so dramatically. I guess it might be like if the Ayatollah in Iran were to announce that he was a follower of Jesus and he's going to become a missionary to the people of Saudi Arabia. I guess it might be like if if, if the president of North Korea were to announce that he is a follower of Jesus and that he's going to repent of his regimes in all of their sins and he's going to turn the whole nation to Christ instead. It's completely unexpected. It might be like the president of, of, of uh, Planned Parenthood were to step forward and say, now she believes in Jesus. And now she's pro-life and she's going to protect life. It's completely unexpected. It's completely almost unbelievable. And that's why for me, one of the great first points that I I take away from this story is this. It's that Paul's conversion gives us hope that God can save anyone. Paul's conversion gives us hope that God can save anyone. Sometimes people give up on themselves when it comes to salvation. They think that their lives have wandered so far from God, they'll never find Him. They think that they, think that they can never change from who they are, and so they end up giving up on God. Have you known people like that? I have. Paul's story tells us that God's able to change anyone. Some of us here, maybe you've not given up on yourself, but you've given up on some other people in your life. Maybe you've given up on a spouse who's made it clear they'll never believe, they'll never give in to Jesus. They think you're nuts. Maybe you've given up on a son or a daughter who has wandered so far in their life from God, you can't imagine that they will ever come back. Maybe you've given up on a co-worker or a friend who is, who is just so resolute in their rejection of God. You see no signs that they will ever come to faith. Paul's story reminds us of this. Sometimes there's, there's no signs that a person is going to turn around. Sometimes... Sometimes a person is so close, in fact, to their goal of resisting God entirely, just like Paul was. 
that that is the moment where they actually turn around and change. And today, I just ask you to look at this story with new eyes. Paul, who was not having any doubts about his view of things, Paul, who was, who was out there with, with, set on violence against the people of God, he not only is going to come to Jesus, but he's going to become Jesus' greatest advocate of his entire generation. Listen to the way that Paul says this about himself. He says, I am the foremost of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.16 I'm the foremost of sinners, but I received mercy for this reason. That in me as the foremost sinner... Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience for an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. Paul saw himself as an example of God's patience. And I don't know, I don't know whether you're thinking about somebody else or you're thinking about yourself this morning. But listen to me carefully. God is in the transformation business. God is God is interested. It's what God does. God changes unchangeable people. God takes people who are unloving and unforgiving. God takes people who are, who are set on themselves and pleasing themselves. God takes people who are, who are living a life of, of profane rejection of Him and He changes their hearts by His grace. And friends, that's good news. For every last one of us. I was speaking to a woman after the first service today. I wish she would have told me her story sooner. She talked about a woman that she worked with a number of years ago. She was her manager. And this woman that she was managing would constantly argue with her about God. And, and the manager would say, you know, it's okay. God loves you anyway. You're going to figure it out. This lady, she went further and further down her own path of resistance. She became a lesbian, left her husband and all of her children for another woman. Eventually, the woman in our church, she lost touch with her. Several years have gone by, and this woman called up and said, could I, could I see you? And so she met her for dinner the other day, just this last week. And the woman said to her, she said, I want to tell you something, and you're not going to believe it. And she said, well, what? What do you want to tell me? And the woman said, well, I, I'm saved now. I've come to Jesus. This woman moved away. I, I, I found myself in a church. I found myself believing. I just want to thank you that every time you were talking to me about God's love, you were showing patience with me, and I didn't forget it. Listen, you, you may have given up on something. You may have given up on someone. You may have given up on yourself, but God hasn't. The story goes on. This is, this is God speaking to Ananias. Ananias, he's... He's someone who uh, serves God. He's, he's a Christian. He's living there in Damascus. And the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. You know, true story. Damascus is one of the oldest still functioning cities in the world. Straight Street is still there. You can see Straight Street today. But he, he says, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man uh, from Tarsus named Saul for he's praying. Hey, listen. Maybe you'd like to have revelation from God like Saul had. Maybe you'd like, you, you just wish that a, a light would knock you down or you wish that you'd have a vision or you wish that God would speak to you. Do you know where it starts? It starts in prayer. That's where it started with Paul. And you know what? Next month, we're going to have 21 days of prayer here. 
We're going to be focused for 21 days asking you to pray, asking for you to spend time with God. The reason why we do that is not just to have a prayer emphasis. It's because when we draw close to God in prayer, we are likely to hear from God. God's likely to do something in our lives. And that's what we see in the New Testament. God worked in these people's lives because they were praying. God was speaking to Ananias because he was praying, and God had spoken to Paul because he was praying. He says, in a vision, maybe you want a vision from God. It begins in prayer. In a vision, he's seen a man, Paul has, named Ananias. That's you, Ananias. Come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And so Ananias, he, he like pauses and he says, wait a second, isn't this the person who's been, you know, after the Christians? Are you sure it's so safe to go and talk to him and everything? But the Lord said to Ananias, go. Go anyway. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles. The reason why the church is mainly a, a, a Gentile reality today is because of Paul's work. Paul decided that he was going to preach the gospel to whoever would hear it. And that's, that, that's what God had picked him for. And he was perfectly set up for it, right? He was not only a Jew and a rabbinical student, but he was also a Roman, a, a Roman citizen. He was somebody who was fluent in Greek. And there, he, he's going to speak to the Gentiles and their kings. Now, numerous stories exist just in the book of Acts about Paul speaking to kings and explaining the gospel to kings. But as we know, as his life unfolds, he eventually appears before Caesar. It was Caesar Nero that Paul had appeared before. It was Nero who adjudicated the case of Paul in the first century. It was, near, it was, it was, it was to the most powerful man in the world at that time that Paul would find himself arguing for the gospel before. These are the plans that God had for Paul. And he says he's going to also speak to the people of Israel. He's the perfect person to speak to all three of those groups. That God's got plans for Paul. And so he says to Ananias, go to him. And he says, on top of all that, I'll show him how much he will suffer. Now, some people, like, they go around and they want to be known, that want it to be known they're an apostle. Maybe you've run into people like that in the church. They, they feel that they're, they're an apostle, they should be called an apostle and known as this and all this kind of thing. The only thing that we see apostles doing in the New Testament is not being honored. Apostles suffer for the gospel. And that's what's going to happen to Paul. He's going to suffer maybe more than the rest. Maybe that's why he needed this vision that he had on the road to Damascus so that he could... He could hold himself strong when he would suffer more deeply than he could have ever imagined. It says Ananias went to the house and he entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, you can just hear him kind of like choking on his words. Brother, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road, to, on the road as you were coming here has sent me. So that you may see again. He sent me so that you'll be healed. This is a constant theme in the book of Acts. God heals people. It's what the Holy Spirit does. He heals people. So he sent me so that you may see again and so that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it says immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. And he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. I just want you to notice there are three elements here that have appeared in nearly every chapter of the book of Acts up to this point. You can go back and look at it. It's that people who come to faith, they are baptized and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it, sometimes it happens in a different kind of order, like here it does. It appears that Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit and then he's baptized after he came to faith 
in Christ there on the road. I, I, but this happens over and over. It happened in Acts chapter 8. We looked at it last week. They, they, were, they, they came to faith, they were, they were baptized, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It happened in, in Acts chapter 4. When the, the believers came together and they were praying, and it says the Holy Spirit fell on them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, all of them, and then they went out and, and they shared the Word of God boldly. In Acts chapter 2, it was the believers who had come together, people who had the Holy Spirit. They needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit anyway. This is the pattern of the book of Acts, the pattern of spirituality. And why am I telling you about it? It's because you and I, in order to become the people that, that God wants for us to become, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to experience everything that God has for us so that we can grow into the people that God wants us to become. Because you know what happened immediately after Paul received the Holy Spirit? He started preaching. He started sharing about Jesus immediately after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at that in just a second, but I just want you to recognize it didn't take him years of learning before he started preaching. He started it right away. Why? Because God had changed his perspective and because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, which gave him incredible insight and gave him incredible boldness to share the good news with others. And so the second thing I, I want to just point out to you here from this story, it's this. The Holy Spirit is indispensable for God's work in our lives. If we're going to become the people who are doing the things that God has planned for us to do, then we need to ask God to graciously fill us with His Holy Spirit. If you will grow closer to the Holy Spirit than you are to your phone or your computer, if you'll grow closer to, your, to the Holy Spirit than you are to your best friend, you'll start to do something more for God than you are right now. Is that fair enough? The Holy Spirit gives Paul courage to boldly share, boldly persuade others. The Holy Spirit somehow grows the seed of the gospel that's been planted in Paul. And then we read this. In, as, as the Acts chapter 9 goes on, it says at once... Right away, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now maybe like this is like the whole thing. Maybe when you think about Christianity and you think about our central most tenant, maybe this is the thing you think of. He's the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe this phrase right here, Jesus is the Son of God, you think that summarizes the, the Christian faith. You know what's interesting about this? This is the only place in the entire book of Acts that Jesus is called the Son of God. It was Paul's message. Jesus is the Son of God. That, that was something unique about what he was preaching. And all those who heard him were astonished. They couldn't believe this was the guy they'd heard about. They couldn't believe how well he was able to articulate the gospel. They couldn't believe his story of, of miraculous transformation. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful. Why? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So the, the people that Paul went to put in jail, he ends up arguing their case for them. And he argues it so well that the people, they become angry with him. And in fact, they get so mad, we won't read about it today, but here in Acts chapter 9, they get so mad that Paul has to be lowered in a basket out out. Out, the, out a window on the wall of Damascus and escape in the middle of the night because they're going to kill him. Paul goes on to Jerusalem, we're told, in Acts chapter 9. And he starts preaching there. And he starts preaching among the Greek-speaking Jews. The Bible says here in Acts chapter 9 they got so angry, they wanted to kill him. And it says that when the believers heard this, they, they, hid, they, they snuck Paul off to the coast, 
They put him on a ship and he went back to Tarsus. Why were they afraid for him? Because Stephen was preaching to the Greek-speaking Jews. They're the ones that first raised the complaint. And, and Stephen was executed. And the church thought, we don't, want, we don't want for that to happen to this guy. So they sent him away. I'm telling you about this because of point number three. It's that, sa- it's that salvation and receiving the Holy Spirit leads to boldly witnessing to the reality of Christ. Now maybe when you hear the word witnessing, you, you don't know, quite know what that means. Or maybe you think that witnessing has to do with arguing with people about, uh, about what you believe. I've got to say, when I do watch some Christians, I, I think that they think that that witnessing has to do with arguing with people about what they don't believe that you believe. That's not what witnessing is. Witnessing is connected to being a witness. When you're a witness, you talk about what you've seen, what you've heard, what your experience was. If you'll be a witness for Christ, it means that you're going you're to talk about the ways that Christ has impacted your life. Listen, if we're going to have an Acts kind of, book of Acts kind of experience with the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is going to start a fire in our lives, it's not just so like we can have a bunch of ec- ecstatic experiences in the, in the Spirit of God, it's so that, so that we can become witnesses who invite people into the reality of Jesus Christ. And today, today I'm just encouraging you, get clear, get clear on your salvation, and those that are, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what the book of Acts should prompt us to do.